this is a special edition of Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the premier financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Now, for this special edition of Macro Voices, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Macro Voices All Stars episode 98 was recorded on March 23rd, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices All Stars is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, the leading podcast when it comes to quant and rules based investing. I'll tell you how to claim a free copy of their new guide to the best investing books ever written at the end of this episode. Joining me now is Forest for the Trees founder, Luke Groman. Luke, today, Monday, the 23rd of March, we had what arguably is the biggest monetary policy intervention in the history of financial markets. Asset prices went shooting straight up, and it lasted less than two hours before they had fully retraced, which really says something. I want to get your perspective on that. But first, let's start with the backstory. What have you been thinking about in the last few weeks as this crisis has begun to unfold with respect to the markets and let's say the last four weeks or so that we've just experienced? Yeah. Hi, Eric. Thanks again for having me on. I think it's I think it'll be great to kind of run through some of the background first, because I think that helps inform what we can then uh, talk about in terms of what rolled out this morning. But, I, you know, I think there's a few things that, that we've been highlighting to subscribers that are incredibly important context to where we go from here. And the first is that in a system as highly levered as ours is, with a fractionally reserved banking system and, and an infinitely levered euro dollar system, you cannot have closed borders, closed stores and open financial markets. As a number of guests on Macro Voices have noted, and and, and we ourselves have said as well, everyone in the world and the U.S. is all massively short dollars. And so they will use those open financial markets as their only available source of cash. And so the financial markets will just become a one-way doom loop trade of of selling, triggering margin calls, which forces more selling, wash, rinse, repeat, uh, until we hit cash outstanding in the U.S. economy, which is basically close to zero for financial markets. Until the Fed prints enough money, you know, and this this is true because you know we started off this crisis with you know relative value hedge funds were operating with a lot of leverage, and you know ball went up, so they had to sell, and the curve inverted, so they had to sell, and that triggered margin calls, et cetera. Well, you know, from here you've seen data showing that those guys have delevered. From here, we're going to see small, mid-sized business owners, citizens emptying out their four hundred one ks for the working capital for their businesses to finance inventory or overhead or just for cash to live. And, you know, this is also true globally, perhaps on an even greater scale. And, you know, as an aside, this is always where I disagreed with Brent Johnson on his on his dollar milkshake theory, which, you know, the euro dollar market is effectively an infinitely levered dollar short. And so, as Brent correctly notes, as the dollar rises, it creates this giant short squeeze higher of the dollar, especially given the massive amounts of dollar denominated debt outstanding. However, and this this is where we've disagreed is that The U.S.'s net international investment position is negative 55 percent of GDP, about 12 trillion dollars. So and and it's it's by far the most negative it has ever been going into a U.S. recession. It's not even close in terms of how how negative is now versus prior recessions. And what this means in plain English is that foreigners own, call it 12 trillion dollars more in dollar assets than we own of their assets. And This is just the natural outcome of the U.S. running, for example, 300 to 400 billion dollar per year deficits against China for nearly 20 years. China ends up with six to eight trillion dollars in dollar denominated assets that they bought with the dollars we sent them. Same thing with the Japanese, same thing with the Germans and a few other creditor nations on down the line. And so when these nations suffering from these very real dollar shortages start to get squeezed, guess what they do to raise dollar cash? They start selling their $12 trillion in dollar-denominated assets, and they don't stop until either the Fed prints enough or stocks go to cash or near zero or the system collapses. And so, like I said, this is this sort of always been my biggest disagreement with Brent regarding the milkshake is, you know, I always see that the dollar could spike. I didn't think it would, uh, and it took a global pandemic to do it. But, you know, I always thought it could. I just didn't think it would. So, he's you know, he's 100% right about that dynamic. 
I just always knew that if it did, it wouldn't be positive for equities. It'd be a total disaster for equities. It'd be a total disaster for global risk assets and even the treasury market, which, you know, all of which we've been seeing in the last week where you're seeing the treasury market get get very dysfunctional very quickly in the sell off. So point one for us, you know, in terms of context for all of this is that as long as financial markets are open, but borders and stores are closed, then unless the Fed prints enough, risk assets are likely going to continue to be a one-way doom loop trade toward total cash outstanding in the economy, which is basically zero. And you know, sort of the other alternative is, is authorities can close markets until the COVID crisis passes, but I get the sense that they really, really don't want to do that. Wow, Luke, I knew I could count on you for a strong view in, uh, in these challenging times. So if the Fed needs to print enough to stop this, I think was one of the things you said just a moment ago. Okay, uh, I'll bite. How much is enough? Because frankly, they just authorized unlimited spending of, of essentially printed money, money conjured out of thin air. And that wasn't enough to boost asset markets for more than two hours. <laughs> it's frightening, isn't it? You know, that's really a moving bogey based on, you know, number one, how long COVID crisis lasts. Number two, how severe it gets and the pace at which it gets severe. And, and number three, how much longer they continue to dawdle in Congress and in getting the money into the, the economy's hands. And so, you know, the longer the crisis goes on with financial markets open and borders and stores closed, the closer markets will crash down to cash. And so the corollary to this, I guess, is is. The longer the crisis goes on with financial markets open, the closer the Fed's balance sheet will have to move toward fully reserving all of the dollar-denominated debt. And all of the dollar-denominated debt in the U.S. alone is $47 trillion. All of the dollar-denominated debt globally is, as best I can tell, 100 or $150 trillion. It's, it's a big number. Wait a minute, Luke. Did I hear that right? You're saying you think the Fed could or, or would actually print $47 trillion to literally buy all of the outstanding debt, the, the balance sheet would have to grow to $47 trillion, and they'd have to leave the economy closed down, but financial markets could, could then remain open. Are you saying that's an actual scenario, or are you just saying that's why it can't happen? I'm saying that if they leave financial markets open and keep the economy closed, the longer this goes on, the closer the Fed's balance sheet will have to go to forty-seven trillion or a hundred trillion to basically buy in all the debt, and so it's it's not right away, but the longer this goes, yeah, that's that's exactly what'll have to happen. And you know, we wrote this to our clients a week ago, and you know, last week they didn't do it, and we had the worst week since oh eight. You know, we we got this announcement this week that the Fed will print one hundred twenty-five billion dollars per day per day to buy Treasuries and MBS. Uh, you know, mortgage backs. Look, that's a thirty-four trillion dollar annual rate. That's that's it's, I, you know, I don't want to play Captain Run rate, but if we look at the last four weeks, they're buying stuff in at close to one hundred percent of GDP on a, on a four-week basis. So let's see if one hundred twenty-five billion dollars is enough. You know, to your point, so far it hasn't been. What happens if they don't do enough and they just let stocks crash toward the cash in the system, as you say, toward zero? You know, that brings me, I think, to what is what I would consider the second key point of context as, as we're trying to figure out our way through this, which is, you know, remember, as, as we've highlighted on Macro Voices numerous times, this crisis started with equity markets at 160 percent of GDP. We've cited IRS data, which notes that net capital gains plus taxable IRA distributions were around 200 percent of annual personal consumption expenditure growth. And that's, you know, personal consumption expenditures, two thirds of GDP. And what this means in plain English is that mathematically, consumer spending can't grow unless stocks are rising and you know consistently hitting new highs. And so the stock market effectively is the economy. So if the Fed just lets stocks fall toward cash, like you said, the economy will start to fall toward cash. And the economy backs the treasury market and by extension, the dollar. And so you know the punchline is that there effectively is no U.S. economy to be flipped. But to I mean, it's not that flipped. There really effectively is no U.S. economy without the stock market consistently setting new highs. And, and, you know, that also ties into my last key point of context as we try to figure this all out. Okay, what is that last point of context? Well, it's, it's another point we've made repeatedly, which is we are in the first global sovereign debt bubble in nearly 100 years, and there's only two ways out. Reinhardt, Carmen Reinhardt and Bellin Zabrancia did some great research uh, in an IMF white paper back in 2015. And 
it was tellingly titled The Liquidation of Government Debt. And so I was just telling you how they get rid of government debt. And they have this great chart showing the sovereign debt bubbles in emerging markets and advanced economies going back 120 years. And every time sovereign debt to GDP got to where it is in advanced markets today and in emerging markets in the 80s and 90s, it always plays out the same way. There's a, there's a sovereign debt crisis, and one of two things happens. You either default or restructure, or you inflate it away with the research paper showing financial repression, inflation, and a couple hyperinflations in each case when, it, when things got this high. So if stocks go toward cash, global sovereigns will likely begin being forced to basically nominally default on their sovereign debt, including the U.S. on treasuries, if the Fed does not print every dollar that's needed. And this, in turn, in terms of the contextual importance of this, to us, this tells us that central banks are likely going to be extraordinarily aggressive. You know, we've, we'd long thought that they would eventually buy everything in sight. And this, this morning, we're seeing the early signs of that. You know, the one thing I'm finding is, is that it seems like many market participants still don't believe how big this could get or how long it could last, you know, mainly in my view, because they're not factoring in the context that the stock market is effectively the economy. And so if the market crashes, as it has, you know, treasuries and global sovereign debt, more broadly speaking, mathematically are going to have a real hard time being made, you know, nominally money good without massive amounts of, of Fed money printing. Okay, Luke, how are you positioned for this? And how should our listeners think about positioning their portfolios for what lays ahead on the horizon? So, you know, we entered this crisis, as we noted, with, with the first global sovereign debt bubble in 100 years. And the last time we had a global sovereign debt bubble and it burst was in the immediate aftermath of World War I. And the sovereign debts of the world's six biggest industrial powers fell 75 to 100 percent in gold terms in under half a generation, two of the six hyperinflated. So, you know, from here, and to be clear, I don't think that's where we're going in this movie here in the U.S. at least. So, you know, from here, either the Fed and, and other central banks either print enough and, and we actually really inflate and gold does really well uh, and I think outperforms just about everything else, which is how it worked out in the last uh, sovereign crisis. Or they don't print enough. The system collapses. Global sovereign debts widely nominally default. And gold also does really well. And so, you know, our favorite asset remains gold. We still really also really like silver, which has had a bit of a tough go of it, along with Bitcoin and gold miners. And I think once gold, et cetera, sufficiently inflates against everything else, sort of devaluing the entire fiat currency system, you know, I think equities will do well, especially against bonds. And regarding bonds, we were too early being negative on bonds, which, as the old saw goes, is indistinguishable from being wrong. But we're now to the point where, look, either bonds have credit risk or bonds have inflation risk, and that includes sovereign bonds. And they're pricing in neither inflation risk or credit risk. You know, currently, because of sort of the short term panic, and more likely, they'll be not pricing in inflation risk because they'll never be allowed to price inflation risk because the Fed or other central banks will cap rates at whatever politically expedient levels they need to be at to basically inflate the way out of this out of this problem. Let's go into a little bit more depth on today's actual intervention actions. Just after eight o'clock this morning, we got news that the Fed had basically said, OK, look, unlimited QE in order to respond to this crisis. And, you know, something I've predicted for weeks and weeks, Luke, is I said, eventually, they're going to change the rules in order to start buying corporate bonds, not just sovereign bonds, and probably also stock shares, most likely through ETFs. And a whole bunch of people on Twitter attacked me and says, you know, you dummy, you don't get it. Read the Federal Reserve Act. They're not allowed to buy corporate bonds. And at the time, I said, they're going to change the rules. Well, I was wrong about that. They, they're not going to change the rules. They're just going to ignore the rules. Uh, what they did this morning was they interpreted the, the Federal Reserve Act to mean that as long as they said they used a special purpose vehicle, which they said they put a treasury backstop on these things, that that created the appearance, at least, of a federal guarantee, which normally, I think, was designed into the Federal Reserve Act to restrict them to only buying government-issued debt. So they're already buying corporate debt, and, and I think stocks through ETFs is probably just around the corner. It's going to be a little bit harder to make up an excuse for, for how they could do that through an SPV. I think they might actually have to change the rules before they can do that, but it probably won't take a whole lot to push that through Congress in these circumstances. So it seems like we're changing all the rules. We're bailing out everybody. We're buying corporate bonds now. And this, to me, it just goes back to that, that old adage about 
privatizing the, the gains and socializing the losses. The taxpayers didn't get their share of Boeing's profits when Boeing was not needing a bailout, but apparently it's the taxpayer's job to bail out Boeing. There's talk of bailouts for the cruise ship industry. Uh, how the heck does the, the need to bail out the cruise ship industry support the, the national security or anything else that you could plausibly justify the government needing to bail out for the betterment of society. But these things are all happening. Where does this leading, and particularly, what's your reaction to the way the market absorbed this? Because until now, any time you, you had a big federal intervention, it meant a big move up in asset prices that lasted for months. We had the biggest one ever, and it lasted two hours before we had fully retraced. Both crude oil and stocks had retraced. The only thing that's still up a few hours after that intervention was announced is gold. Where is all this headed? You know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we wrote to subscribers, you know, because we, we got hit with the same thing, Eric, of you know, look, they'll buy corporate bonds when they need to. And we were told in no uncertain terms that we didn't know what we were talking about and that they would need an act of Congress to change that. And, you know, my response to our subscribers is like, look, that's true. I would just say that we also technically need an act of Congress to go to war. And the last time the Congress declared war on anybody was Japan on December 8th, 1941. Now, since then, we have had police actions in Korea, police actions in Vietnam. We've been in Iraq for 20 years. We've been in Afghanistan. And so the fact that we were not at war probably was of, of no condolence to the family who lost loved ones in those wars. So point being that exactly like you said, when they need to change the rules to save the system, they'll change the rules. And, and there's examples of this, right? You know, the Hunt brothers cornered silver. And guess what? They shut down the buy side. They said, you go sell only on silver futures. You know, we saw this in September of 08 with the short selling ban in financials. We saw it in April of 09 when we said, you know what, you got to keep, you know, the mark to market gains on the way up. But now we're going to suspend mark to market accounting on the way down. So there's been, you know, if, if you've been paying close enough attention, you sort of knew how this was going to go once it got bad enough. And so that's, I think, the first read is, you know, it got bad enough. The system's really being threatened. And so they need to do this. You know, in terms of the various sectors, I agree. It's tough to do. That said, when you're in a highly levered system, you can't allow really anything anywhere to default because it just creates all these ripples. And so I think, you know, this process that we've been describing together on air, Eric, and, and watching has that has been, you know, progressing really from the third quarter of 2014 when global central banks stopped sterilizing U.S. deficits. Well, no problem. We'll just sterilize them ourselves. And Japanese and, and German pension funds will sterilize them themselves. And that's fine. They did that until 3Q18 when FX edge treasury yields went negative. And then we had to sterilize them all ourselves. Well, no problem. We'll do it all ourselves. And then the banks started choking on them in March of 2019. And then the banks really started choking on them in, you know, sort of fall of last year, right? When we had the uh, repo rate crisis where overnight rates traded through duration and the Fed had to reverse themselves, begin really growing their balance sheet to basically cap overnight rates. And, you know, this coronavirus crisis just is a real doozy, brings it all forward. I think any something things that would have happened eventually anyway, not this fast, but ultimately, you know, people say, well, why'd they bail out these hedge funds? Well, you know, we were writing in our research back in December saying, look, if you look at what's happening here, the biggest marginal creditor of the United States government are levered hedge funds. They're these, these big relative value hedge funds. And we said in our research, if vol goes up and or if the curve inverts, they have to sell. And then suddenly there's only the Fed left to buy. And so earlier this year, the Fed tried to you know, stop growing their balance sheet, thought it would be a bad idea. You know, we said to people and to our subscribers at the end of January, you know, we're getting near-term cautious because, look, we think it's a bad idea for the Fed to stop growing their balance sheet, but that's what apparently they're going to do. The coronavirus thing, quite frankly, caught us by surprise. Hats off to you. You were totally all over it and, and nailed it. But the punchline, it was vol went up, the curve inverted, and suddenly biggest marginal buyer treasuries, which have been these big riddle to value hedge funds, turned sellers. And so it was very interesting to me. You know, initially, you had this run into, you know, in the, the spike in, you know, TLT, for example, the long dated treasury. And then the thing friggin' crashed. And, you know, treasuries haven't, you know, you've seen spreads blow out. The, the treasury market has not traded in this, in this crash. 
which by the way is the biggest, fastest you know, decline in history from the highs, they've not traded very healthily. And, and so to me, it all comes back to one answer in terms of well, why are they doing this? And this is, this is a U.S. balance of payments problem coming to a head. It's, you know, it's in the guise of you know, coronavirus and the shutdown of the economy, and it's making it far worse. But now that it's here, people say, well, they'll just, they'll just reverse the balance sheet when this is all over. I know they're buying $600 billion a week, but they'll, they'll reverse that. And I kind of say, we've seen this movie. They, that's what they said last time. And they were able to reverse $300 billion, and they blew up the system with help from the virus. So like, I, I get the sense, A, that people don't realize fully what's happening yet here. And I think you know, people say, well, once the dollar endgame gets here, then, you know, then I'll sell my strong dollar and I'll buy gold. Well, you're watching around the world. You're seeing not just offering premiums blow out on physical metals, but now the bid side's starting to rise. That's important. And not only at retail, but it's starting to rise in wholesale markets. And so, you know, we're moving in this direction where, look, as, as a gold holder, you know, price is whatever it is today. It's up 50 bucks. Am I going to sell my gold here? Knowing that the Fed's got to basically buy the debt market if they don't get this thing under control? Hell no. I'm not selling my gold for here. I mean, <laughs> fair value of it might be $7,000 minimum based on some of the work we've done. So, you know, if someone wants to bid me $7,000 for it, I'll start thinking about it. But again, that's going to depend on sort of where it goes. So my overall take is sort of the next crisis was going to trigger a U.S. balance of payments problem if it was just a minor crisis. And this is an enormous crisis. And so the Fed's having to buy it all. Luke, there's another aspect of this I want to ask you about, and that is a prediction I've made for many years, which is someday, I'm not sure what's going to cause it, but someday we're going to get into a mode where finally both stocks and bonds are selling off at the same time, and it forces an unwind of the entire risk parity trade, which is really the, the, the core of most of institutional finance for the last several years. I asked Jim Bianco about this last week, but I want to get your perspective. feels to me like maybe we're finally there, because in the early days of this COVID crisis, the, the Treasury yields could do nothing but go down. All of a sudden, they seem to be maybe starting to reverse. Is this the beginning of the popping of the, the bond bubble, both sovereign and corporate? Oh, I think it absolutely is. It, it absolutely is, in my view. And, and I think it's the beginning of the end of the dollar's reserve status is structured. How can you hold dollars as a reserve asset when the Fed is printing $125 billion a day of them out of thin air at the drop of a hat? It's not a reserve asset. It's not. And so, you know, that's ultimately be really good for the U.S. on the other side of this. You know, the Chinese have been using the structure of the post-71 dollar system against us for the past 20 years. And, you know, it's been getting Washington rich. It's been getting the Chinese rich. It's been getting Wall Street rich. It's not been getting America rich. It's not been getting flyover country rich. And so, you know, this is a change that has needed to happen. And it was moving slowly, but to us, very perceptibly accelerating in that direction. And it's, and it's brought it all forward. And so I think once you sort of cross the Rubicon, and I think ultimately that's what the Fed really did I thought they were there last fall, but now I think that I think everybody's starting to think that, right? Of or a lot more people certainly. There was a great chart somebody put in front of me over the weekend. It showed in the worst of the '08 crisis, the Fed was buying I think 2.5 billion or three three billion dollars a day in bonds. They're buying 125 billion a month, and it's not enough. It's not enough. And so, to me, I, I think it's also helping set a narrative, right? If 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 I wanted to set a narrative to significantly devalue the dollar and all fiat currencies against gold to basically reset the system, I would fire the big gun. I'd say, I'm going to buy it all and then let markets keep falling. And, you know, I'm not saying there's some big hand running the whole thing, but I'm just saying what, what the markets are telling you is it's not enough. The dollar's got to go way, way lower. The Fed's got to buy more. And, and look, if the Fed's already going to buy it all, they can buy equities, but there's one thing left for them to bid for to convince people that the, that the, that the dollar's going down and they, they are reticent to even say the word. But look, if you keep having markets go down, even though they're buying all the bonds, they might have to end up bidding for gold. You know, we wake up one day and the Fed says, hey, gold's $10,000 an ounce now. Gold's $20,000 an ounce. Now what? Like, <laughs> we've, we've got a new system. Like, the entire global central bank balance sheets are rebalanced. You've got a new sovereign asset, neutral reserve asset, something we've been talking about ad nauseum forever. And away we go. And so, you know, to me, 
boy, as I watched them fire the big gun and it didn't work, that's, you know, we're a step closer to that day where whether it's the Fed, whether it's the BIS, whoever it is, you know, bidding for gold to basically sort of bring it back into the system to create the, the dollar liquidity needed to stop things from collapsing. Look, before I let you go, I want to tell our listeners, you, you published the Tree Rings newsletter at Forest for the Trees. First of all, for anybody who's not familiar with Tree Rings, tell them what it is. But you've also got a special promotion going on. Tell us about that as well. Absolutely. It's, it's a, uh, you know, 10 most interesting things we've picked up in the week with a brief synopsis of why we think it's important and sort of where the signposts are, are, are pointing to or why it's serving in our view as a signpost. So we get a lot of great feedback from it. And we're, we're running a, pre, or a special on it now with a March 31st sign up deadline. Starting April 1st, we're increasing prices, but you can lock in current price for life and get a first, first month free. And, you know, we put a bunch of investments based on the success of the product into the platform supporting it. So we, we now have a access to all of our webinar replays that we do, complete archive access to back issues back to August of 2019. We've also invested to create a community forum and you get full access to that where you can share and learn from other Tree Rings members, our top 20 book recommendations, and like we said, a price guarantee for life. So people are interested in uh, learning more about what we're hearing, saying, and how we're seeing the world, check it out at fftt-llc.com. Well, Luke, I can't thank you enough for another terrific interview. We look forward to getting you back in a few weeks for another update. And at the pace things are going, uh, the world will probably be a very different place between now and then. Meanwhile, listeners, I want to encourage you to stay tuned to your Macro Voices feed this week. We've got a Hot Topic interview coming up with Lenore Hawkins, the global macro strategist for Tematica Research. She's reporting from Ground Zero in Lake Como, Italy. And I've also got Dr. Steve Bickle, new guest on Macro Voices, longtime Macro Voices listener and supporter. Steve is a physician in Florida, which is also a uh, hot spot for COVID-19. He's going to give us his own Ground Zero report on what the healthcare community sees coming there. And we'll talk quite a bit about how to determine whether you yourself, as I'm struggling to determine, have a mild case of COVID-19, because frankly, it's hard to distinguish from the, the regular seasonal flu that might be going around in your area. All of that is coming up in Hot Topic number 11. It's in the editing booth now. I don't know if that'll be out on Tuesday or Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we've got Simon White from Variant Perception joining me in the feature interview on our regular flagship podcast on Thursday evening. So be sure to stay tuned for all of that. I want to especially thank the people who have donated. This particular interview with Luke Roman was sponsored by Top Traders on Plus. All these other extra episodes were made possible by your generous donations. So I really want to thank everyone who's donated to Macro Voices to make the extra content possible. This episode of Macro Voices All Stars was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com, the leading podcast on quant and rules based investing. Be sure to claim your free copy of their recently updated guide to the best investing books ever written at toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro guide. And if you haven't heard it yet, be sure to check out my full-length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson on trend-following strategies, which is linked in your research roundup email. For the Macro Voices Podcast Network, I'm Eric Townsend. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. 
Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices.